Okay, what I would like to do now, please, is uh, have some questions. I'd have to ask that the questions be confined to things that we covered, to things that we covered. And I fully realize there are people who are new to this teaching, as well as people who are more experienced. So don't think your question is, is somehow too elementary to, to be asked. Uh, there's no such, the only dumb question is, is not asking one. The only, the only dumb question, what's dumb is not the question, what's dumb is not asking it. That's dumb. Not asking it is dumb. The question is not dumb. Failing to ask it because you think it's dumb, that's dumb. Okay? Yes, brother. The 144,000 that are marked with the seal card. Right. How do they differ from the other 140,000? Yeah, the hundred, there are debates if the 144,000 in Revelation chapter 7 and the Revelation chapter 14 are the same group or not. There is quite a, 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 a debate that's always gone on. Some would say these second group, one group appears to be in heaven, the other group appears to be on earth. That, however, does not necessarily mean that they're not the same group. Let's begin with the 144,000 in Revelation 7. The 144,000 in Revelation 7 are people who are plainly anointed for ministry here on the earth. Okay? They're plainly anointed for ministry here on the earth. Okay? The second group in chapter 14, and we really didn't go into them at depth, any depth, I looked and behold a lamb was standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 having his name and the name of his father written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the sound of many waters and the sound of loud trumpets and the voice which I heard was like the sound of harpists playing their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures. It appears to me it appears to me th these have been purchased from among men as the first fruits to God and to the Lamb. Okay? These are the ones who have not been defiled with women. They have kept themselves chaste. They are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These have been purchased from among the men, the first fruits to God and to the Lamb. Okay? This does not mean they're two different groups. It could be the same group that is now in heaven. Notice the 144,000 are mentioned in chapter 7 before the others, before the great multitude no man can number. This 144,000 are mentioned first. It could very well be, and I am inclined to believe, it is the same group, only now we see that same group in heaven. Okay? Now, the complication is the term the first fruit. The term the first fruit always implies resurrection. It always implies resurrection. That's where it gets complicated. These are the ones who have not been defiled, but it goes on to say, these have been purchased from among men as the first fruits. Uh, it could be, again, that it would have seemed to be that when the rapture and resurrection happen, the dead in Christ will rise first. These are the premier or the preeminent among them. These are the premier or the preeminent among them. First fruit has a resurrection connotation. I am, again, I will not teach something dogmatically until I'm 100% sure. The best I can see at this point is that they are the same group. One is them on earth. The second is when the same group appears in heaven. Okay? They represent the remnant of Israel. They represent the faithful remnant of Israel. God's original lights to the nations, God's original messengers of the gospel, 12,000 from each tribe. I'd also point out the following, that you have one tribe missing, don't you? The tribe of Dan is missing. Now, there are three ways to understand the fact that the tribe of Dan is missing. One goes back to the curse of Jeroboam II when they worshipped the golden calf. They went back to the original sin of the golden calf with Moses in the wilderness. So they were cut off from the other tribes. That's one aspect. Okay. A second aspect is, because they're not named, there are those who speculate, speculate that one of the two beasts will be from the tribe of Dan, speculatively. That's the second aspect. I only say that there are those who speculate about that, okay? Although some more than speculate. I wouldn't be dogmatic about any such thing at this point, but there are those who speculatively say it, okay? The third, obviously, is there could only be 12 tribes. Somebody has to go, okay? 
So what happens is, instead of a tribe of Joseph, you have his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. That would give 13. Somebody had to go. Well, who would go? Obviously the tribe of Dan. <coughs> the tribe of Dan because of the sin of Jeroboam. They were way up north. If you've been with us to Israel, you've seen the, the altar where they worship the golden calf. And if you come with us to Israel, we'll show it to you. They were, they were way up. It's like a finger of Israel that sticks up into Lebanon. Okay? It's different than the rest of the country. Very pretty place, but way, way up in the middle of nowhere. The faithful people in the tribe of Dan came south because of the idolatry, including the parents of Samson. They came way down to Bet Jerim, okay, way down south, okay. So Dan is, 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 Dan is missing. Dan comes from the word din, judgment. They have this idea of, of, of judgment. Uh, I could say further things, but they'd be speculative. I just want to stick to as much as I understand. So the answer to your question is, it does seem to me to be the same group, one on heaven, one on earth. I don't see them as two different groups as, as some people did. So they're all big Jews? Yes, they're physical Jews, yes. So they're the only ones that are marked, the only ones that... Yes, because the church is taken out of here, you see? So yeah, they have, a, God turns His grace back towards the Jews and they have a, a, mess, a ministry at, at that time, okay? They have a ministry at that time. Uh, yes? Um, is there a relationship, apart from it sounding like, between Hellenism and El? No. No. Just in the Hellenistic world, the word, the concept for the netherworld was Hades. Okay? And the only relationship you'd have is that when they wrote the Septuagint or when they wrote the New Testament, they used the Greek equivalent terms for Sheol, which would have been Hades. But there is no relationship between, between the two etymologically. Helen comes from Helen of Troy. You know, like the... the yes. yes? You mentioned Joshua relating to the millennial reign. Yes. <laughs> The millennium begins with Jesus coming back and conquering the world. Once it's conquered, there's no more wars. But the millennium is introduced by two things. The battle of Armageddon, God's final conquest in Christ with the saints, okay? And then a remaking of the biosphere and, and a geographical reforming of the earth in part, okay? So it begins with the conquest, okay? This is not to say the entire book of Joshua is a picture of the millennium. A better picture of the millennium is the reign of David and Solomon, where God gave him peace on every side. That is a better picture. The late, latter reign of David and the reign of Solomon is a better picture of, of what the millennium would be like. Joshua's conquest is a picture of how the millennium is introduced through the Battle of Armageddon. Okay. Yes, Peter. Regarding Revelation 12, 17. A little bit louder, please, Peter. Sorry, a little oh, sorry. Um, Revelation 12, 17, um, and the woman was enraged with the woman, sorry, the dragon was enraged with the woman and went to make war with the rest of her offspring. Yes. You said that was the church, not raptured. Do, do you mean by that that's Gentiles saved after the rapture? Okay. The woman and the rest of her offspring. The woman is Israel. Okay. The man-child is what comes out of the woman. The church comes out of Israel. is taken out of here. Okay. Once the church is taken out of here, he goes after the woman, Israel, and the unraptured church, the, the, the foolish virgins. Turn to the Song of Solomon, please. <coughs> yeah, that's another tape people should listen to. Sorry. Thank you for your question, because I would have overlooked this if you didn't ask the question. See? There's no such thing as a dumb question. There's only a such thing as a dumb Jacob. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Sorry? That over that's the tape, but it overlaps with, with stuff that's on the others. Song of Solomon, please. Hashir Hashirim. The Song of Solomon is read in the synagogues on the Saturday of Hag Matzot, a Passover week, okay? Jesus dies, 
He's in the grave on the Saturday. He raises on the Sunday. That Saturday is when the Song of Solomon is read in the synagogues, okay? What Jesus does the last week of his life is he takes what's being read ritually in the temples and in the synagogue and he messianically applies it to himself as the fulfillment. For instance, on the Palm Sunday video, we explained they were singing the Hallel Rabbah, the great praise from Psalm 113 to 118, singing Hosanna, Hosanna to the Son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus says, this is fulfilled. Have you not heard the building block that was rejected has become the cornerstone? That is, the Hallel Rabbah was used in the liturgy for Passover. Okay. <coughs> the liturgy used in the synagogue, you got the specific Passover liturgy that you use in the Passover meal is called the Haggadah. But a Jewish prayer book, the basic synagogue liturgy is called a Siddur. It's a prayer book from the Hebrew Lesader, to set in order. It's the Hebrew word for liturgy. This pen's going dead. But then you have a special kind of liturgy for holidays called a machzor. So what Jesus is doing during what Christians call Passion Week is he's taking the Hebrew liturgies from the Haggadah, from the Machzor, from the Siddur, and he's showing how he's going to fulfill them in his death and resurrection, okay? Now the rabbis don't see this, obviously, or they may see it's about the Messiah, but they just don't see Jesus as being that Messiah, tragically. Let's understand this now to answer your question. Look with me to the Song of Solomon. The Song of Solomon is constructed around two dreams. Okay? Solomon's romance with Shulamit. Solomon becomes a picture of Christ, Shulamit of the bride. It also mirrors in some way God's relationship with Israel. However, we know in the Hebrew, it's, it's a poem, we know in the Hebrew from the number and the gender what the bridegroom is singing, what the bride is singing, and what the witnesses to the romance are singing. They sing the refrains and things. They're like the Tzavaot Hashemayim, the hosts of heaven. Okay, they're like the angelic witnesses. So the witnesses to the romance represent the host of heaven. The bridegroom represents the Messiah and the bride represents the bride. Okay? It's constructed around two dreams. Two dreams. The first dream is chapter 3 verse 1. Now remember the bridegroom comes for the bride in the night. Waiting for the dawn. On my bed, night after night, I sought him, whom my soul loves. I sought him, but did not find him. I must arise now and go about the city, in the streets and in the squares. I must seek him, whom my soul loves. <coughs> I sought him, but did not find him. The watchmen, as it were the police, who make the rounds of the city, found me. And I said, have you seen him whom my soul loves? Scarcely had I left them when I found him whom my soul loves. I held on to him and would not let him go until I brought him to my mother's house, into the room of her who conceived me. And then it begins the refrain. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or by the hinds of the field, that you will not arouse or awaken my love until she pleases. What is this coming up from the wilderness like columns of perfume with myrrh and frankincense? Now what is myrrh? Again? For burial, only for burial, okay. The bridegroom comes anointed for burial. The bride is seeking him desperately. Okay. She wants him to come. The Jewish wedding had three phases that were all important. The first phase was betrothal. 
The betrothal was legally binding. You needed a divorce to get out of it. It was legally binding. It was the contractual. The second was the nuptial itself. And the third was consummation. All three had to take place. Okay. However, between the first phase and the second, between the betrothal and the nuptial, the bridegroom would go away for approximately a year. No exact fixed amount of days, but approximately a year. And he would build on an extension to his father's house or a house next to his father's house. He'd build an annex, which would be like one house attached to another. Okay. The bride would know that he's getting closer to his coming, but he'd always come in the night. And they'd come with torches, go out to meet him with lamps. A call up, the bridegroom is coming, the bridegroom is coming. And then you'd have the nuptial, and then you would have the consummation. The Song of Solomon talks about these things metaphorically. It speaks of, of erotic love and things like this through poetic symbolism. Come into my garden, my beloved, and plant seeds in the garden, and all this stuff. It's talking about having children and so forth. Okay. Chapter 3, she is waiting for him to come to have this nuptial. And he shows up and she finds him and would not let him go. That's chapter three. That is her best dream. She's having this dream on her bed. Chapter five of the Song of Solomon. Now it's not the bridegroom spe bride speaking, it's the bridegroom. I've come into my garden, my sister, my bride. I have gathered my myrrh along with my balsam. I've eaten my honeycomb and my honey. I've drunk my wine and my milk. Eat, friends, drink and imbibe deeply, O lovers. Now the gender changes. It's her. Now he's coming. Now the initiative is his. But now it changes to her. I was asleep, but my heart was awake. A voice. My beloved was knocking, open to me, my sister, my darling, my dove, my perfect one, for my head is drenched with dew, my locks with the damp of the night, always the night. But she says, I've taken off my dress, how can I put it on again? I've washed my feet, how can I get them dirty again? Do you have to come now, Henry? <laughs> Can we do this tomorrow? <laughs> Not tonight, I have a headache. <laughs> Etc. My beloved extended his hand to the opening. My feelings were roused for him. Oh, all right, I'm, I'm coming, I'm coming. I arose to open my beloved. Now my hands dripped with myrrh. She's facing death. On the handles of the bolt, I opened to my beloved, but he'd turned and gone away. My heart went to him as he spoke. I looked for him, but I couldn't find him. I called, but he didn't answer me. Now she goes to the watchman again. Where is he? And the watchman who made the rounds in the city found me. They struck me and wounded me. The guards of the walls took away my shawl from me. What happens to the bride who's not ready? Jesus took what was being read ritually in the synagogue that week. When he gives the Olivet Discourse, the wise and foolish virgins. You're either ready for the bridegroom or you're not. This applies to whole churches even. Okay. Is she really ready for him to come? Is the oil in the lamp? Just in case I have to get up, I have to keep my dress there. I have to keep my sandals here. I have to make sure there's oil in the lamp before I go to bed. He might come tonight, he might come tonight, he might come tonight. Okay. Okay. When Jesus comes for every one of us and for every church, every congregation, every one, it's either going to be our best dream or our worst nightmare. You understand? What he was saying is it's going to be your best dream or your worst nightmare. The parable of the, the wise and foolish virgins. 
in the Olivet Discourse, the second half of, of Olivet Discourse, Matthew 25 half. Remember, the Olivet Discourse is 24 and 25. Talking about the second half now. It is simply what was going to be read in the synagogue the following Shabbos. <laughs> Best dream or worst nightmare. Okay. So, obviously, there are people who are not going anywhere. They'll desperately seek for Jesus. They'll desperately look for the rapture. But it's not going to happen. What's left for them? Don't awaken my love until she pleases. We are not, strictly speaking, waiting for Jesus to come back. He's waiting for the bride to be ready. Remember what it says in Luke? When do the harvesters come? When the crop permits. When the full harvest of souls comes in, he can come. That's what it means, hasten his coming. You want to make Jesus come faster, witness, and, witness to people and, and disciple them. So they can go out and witness to people and disciple them. That's how we can make him come faster. That's the only way to make him come faster. The persecution is a purifying process. God allows it because the church is in such a bad shape. It's so lukewarm, it doesn't want to get out of bed and get its feet dirty. That's what it comes to. That's Laodicea's dilemma. Turn to Jeremiah 8.20, please. This is what they'll say. Harvest is past. Summer is ended. We are not saved. There'll be no bomb in Gilead. <laughs> the woman and the rest of her offspring. Only the man child gets out of here. Okay. Another question, please. The baby of the woman is the church. Okay, the baby of the woman, it's a midrash. It's talking about the nativity story. Okay? The church is the body of Christ. What happened to Jesus physically, the way he was physically born and rescued, physically happens to his body, the church. One is a picture of the other. It's the midrash. A is to B as B is to C. Okay. Another question, please. Yes, brother. Yeah, when you mentioned that Queen of Sheba yesterday. The Queen of Sheba, yes. Um, said that before Solomon was revealed, she was taken out. And I thought, couldn't it be that she was deceived? Because in 2 Chronicles 9 4, there was no more spirit in her when she saw his wisdom. That's right. Um, then verse 12, she goes back to her servants with all his gifts, which is all she desired. So what did she actually take back? Okay, it's a historical story. The Peshet is the historical narrative, the story. We are concerned with the Pesha, the deeper meaning, okay? What it meant for there, but what it means for another time in another place. Remember it says she had no spirit in her, remember? The Holy Spirit is taken from the church, not from the hearts of the people, but from the church, there's no spirit, and then she gets taken out of here, okay? What does she take with her? She takes her servants and goes back to her own land. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. The, once the spirit is taken, that's it. Spirit's taken, then she's here for a while, but then gone. This guy is going to be a unique piece of work. <laughs> Can you imagine somebody who is so powerful and so gifted and so eloquent and appears in the character of Lucifer as an angel of light looking Christ-like to the point where people can be that spiritually deluded? Frightening. Not only that, he's going to know the scripture. He is going to know the scripture. If you can't see through people who pervert... Remember, I call it the oldest trick in the book. 
What Satan did when he tempted Eve, he took scriptures out of context. What Satan did when he tempted Jesus, he perverted scriptures out of context. A text out of context, in, life, in, in isolation from its co-text, is always a pretext. A text out of context, in isolation from its co-text, is a pretext. These people do it all the time. The name it and claim it people do it. The binding and loosing people do it. Rodney Howard Brown is a master at it. He changes one word in a verse and gives it a completely different meaning. This is the signature of Satan. When you see people taking a text out of context, an isolation from its co-text, and making it a pretext, that is the unmistakable signature of Satan, of the, of the serpent, <laughs> okay? And I, I point to people, if you can't see through the money preachers, if you can't see through Joyce Meyer, if you can't see somebody like her who's obviously bad, if you can't see through her, there is no possible way you're going to see through this guy. No possible way. Now just look at her. She's got the spirit of Jezebel. Women usurping spiritual authority over men. She's into all the money thing, just like the wicked one. <laughs> she personifies much of that wickedness. She's only one example. The, the Marilyn Hickey be another. There's a whole thing with these women. You got the Jezebels, and you've got the Ahabs. Jan. And what's Jan's wife's name? David. You have Jan, Paul, Paul, yeah, Paul, and you have Jan, yeah. <laughs> you got the, Jim and Tammy. <laughs> Quite a situation. Quite a situation. You got the, the, ultimately, you'll have the political and the religious. I didn't understand that. The character that you see in Revelation becomes embodied in those people. There are many antichrists and many false prophets, but you will see the ultimate character of the antichrist and false prophet personified in, in, in the other ones. For instance, women usurping authority over men, spiritual leadership in the church, ordination of women, the Joyce Myers type thing, and she's into the money, the wealth, well, just like that woman in Revelation. Okay, same thing. You've got the Jan and you got the Paul <laughs> Crouch. You got the Jim and Tammy. You got the Ahab spirit and you got the Jezebel spirit. <coughs> Ultimately, of course, that points to something religious and something political working in tandem. Almost out of time. One more question. Yes, this, okay, two more questions. I have two more questions. Go ahead. Can you just explain about the trumpets again? Okay, the silver trumpets are the ones for warning God's people or calling them to a convocation. Calling them to a convocation for purposes of warning or just for warning. Those are the silver trumpets, okay? Those are trumpets blown for God's people to hear. The shofars, the ram's horns, are something different. That is blown on the year of Jubilee. The year of Jubilee is when we get back what we lost. The dominion of Antichrist, what's it say in Daniel, will be given to the saints of the Most High. The meek shall inherit the earth. This world has become the kingdom of our God and His Messiah, and we shall reign, we are going to reign with Him. The ram's horn is not blown for believers. It is blown for reprobates, for unbelievers, for the enemies of God. It is the, one is the horn of judgment and convocation. Okay, the other is the horn of divine wrath. Okay. They're not the same horn in Hebrew. One is metallic, one is uh, organic. And they're blown for two different reasons, two different days, for two different purposes. By different people. Yes, brother. I don't know enough about Antiochus to know why he was included with Herod and Solomon. In your list of okay, Antichrist. we tried to explain this up in Macedonia. Man wants to be God. Satan wants to be worshipped as God, so he puts this in man. The Greek word for God is Theos, or Theo. Zeus, Zeus, is a corruption of it. They identified him later with Jupiter because it was the biggest planet, but that's not so important. It's important, but not so important. Antiochus was from a dynasty. 
After Alexander the Great died, his armies, his four leading generals divided his empire into four sections as Daniel prophesied. One of these generals was Seleucus. Seleucus. From whom came the Seleucids? The Syrophoenician people. The Greeks of the Levant. The Greeks who lived in places like Lebanon were them. Luke, Saint Luke, Luke the physician, was Syrophoenician, okay? Um, these people had, had, had a Greco-Asian, they were Greco-Asian. Okay, that's how to put it, Greco-Asian. Okay, uh, but these Greeks who came down and, and, and colonized had a dynasty of Antioch. You had four Antiochs, the first, the second, the third, and the fourth. The fourth one was Antiochus Epiphanes. He's the one who builds an image in the temple of Zeus, giving Zeus his own fe facial features and slaughters a pig in the temple. Now how he got power teaches about how the Antichrist will seduce the church. We deal with this on the Christmas Hanukkah and the Return of Christ tapes. If you want to understand how he did it and how God's people compromised with the world with Hellenism and how that's happening in the last days, that is on the Christmas Hanukkah Return of Christ tapes. I explain the whole thing. There's also another tape, we deal with it somewhat, called Stars That Shine from Daniel chapter 12. Stars That Shine from Daniel 11 and 12. We also look at it from a slightly different aspect. But the main tape explaining it in depth is Christmas, Hanukkah, and the return of Christ. Okay. Okay. Superb. Oh, yes. Okay. One, this is it. <laughs> you got to get... Like the, the trumpets and the bowls, do they overlap over there? There would... Uh, okay. We mainly concerned ourselves with the seals and somewhat with the trumpets. That other stuff comes later. <laughs> we didn't talk about it in this oh, conference. To, to, the the no, there's no overlap between the, the seals and the trumpets, except that the last seal releases the trumpets. Okay? Kronos. All right. Once again, thank you for joining us. If you want any of these tapes, you can talk to David if you live in America. You can speak to Allison and to Alec and Julie if you live in the British Isles. Uh, if you live elsewhere, we'll get you the Moriel address from the country where you live, either South Africa from Elijah or from uh, New Zealand or from, from Marg in Australia. Uh, if you want to get them for, in your home country. Uh, they're also available online over the internet. Um, but if you're coming to Turkey, please listen to those three tapes I, I, I told you about if you're coming. If you'd like information about the other half of this tour, the seven churches, uh, just give us your name and address and we'll get you the brochure. Also, we have an electronic newsletter called Be Alerts. You can subscribe to it online. Uh, a lot of people read it. It's something that God has really used for a lot of people. It's not just Moriel stuff. It's a biblical perspective on the news. You've got so much bias in the, in, the, in the secular media today and even so much conspiracy theory madness in the secular media, in the Christian media. We want to have something that is bi factual, biblically balanced. Um, if you'd like to subscribe to our electronic newsletter, be alert. We will tell you how to do it. Just speak to David. Uh, our website is moriel.org and you can subscribe online, okay?